This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. So, okay. So, uh, let's see. Let's, uh, we'll finish up ellipsoid method today, which will finish up actually the first entire section of the class, which is non-differentiable, methods for non-differentiable optimization. And then we're going to move on to the second chunk of the class, which is a very, very cool material. It's going to be uh, uh, distributed and decentralized optimization. So this is like really, really, uh, it's going to be, it, that's really, really fun stuff. Okay, so let's do ellipsoid method. Um, I think ellipsoid method, uh, you remember from last time, is uh, you don't have to say anything other, this picture is it. You don't need anything else. Uh, there we go, sorry, the picture came back. Um, so this picture, now why would that be? Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, this picture says everything. You don't need to know anything else about the ellipsoid method. It basically says you take an ellipsoid like this, uh, in which you know the solution if it exists lies. You evaluate a subgradient or a cutting plane at the center. You call a cutting plane oracle, and you that eliminates a half space. It says that the solution for sure is not in this half ellipsoid. Now you know it's in this half ellipsoid, and what you do in order to keep a constant size state or data structure that summarizes your uh, ignorance. Well, you can call it knowledge or ignorance, I guess. If you look at the inside or outside of the ellipsoid. Um, to do that, you put the minimum volume ellipsoid around that half ellipsoid, and that's your, up, that's your, that's your new point. So, so that's, uh, that's it. Um, and I think we, we, we looked at these, and we looked at the example in, in detail. Uh, the formula is, is, is here. Uh, in fact, the interesting part is the only thing you do is take a, you take a step in a scaled gradient direction. And the scaled gradient direction, um, you scale uh, by a positive definite matrix that you update. And in fact, that, what that matrix does at each step, it, you, actually, you, uh, you, you actually dilate space in the direction of the gradient. So the original name for the ellipsoid method is so, well, I don't know what it was because it's in Russian, but, uh, but when it's translated into English, it's, it's something like subgradient method with space dilation in the direction of the gradient. So that's, that's the original full title translated into English. Actually, I, I've seen what the Russian looks like, and it looks long, too. So um, that, that's what it is. Okay. Um, we talked about the stopping criterion, and then here this gives you your full uh, ellipsoid method is, is here. Um, compared to a subgradient method, uh, well, we can talk with, it's an order n squared algorithm because in, if nothing else, you have to write all over p. Uh, so it's an order n, squ and n squared plus, of course, a subgradient evaluation. That might cost more. Um, it's order n squared uh, to do this. And in fact, let's see, the only, oh, and of course, the storage is now n squared. In a subgradient method, you only have to store something like n. So um, it's not too relevant, and I can tell you why, uh, because this thing is so slow running this for more than 100 variables is going to take like 50 years or something anyway, so there's no point really worrying about this, any storage or anything like that issues here. Okay, um, we talked about that, and we looked at an example. And I want to just mention a couple of improvements. Um, improvements just means, you know, a handful of lines to, to, to make this thing work better. Um, one is, of course, it's not a descent method, so you would keep track of, of the best point found so far. Um, and, you, and of course, at each step, you get a, a lower bound. And that lower bound is the, object, is the function value minus this. Now, remember what this thing is. This is the minimum of, an affine, of the affine lower bound on the function over the current ellipsoid. Um, so this is a lower, lower bound on, on the optimal value. Um, and this does not increase. So your lower bound does not increase. Therefore, you keep tra track of the best one. That's LK. Um, and you stop when UK minus LK is less than epsilon. Now, when you stop, this is a completely non-heuristic stopping criterion. It's completely non-heuristic because u is, after all, it's the function, it's the objective value obtained by a point you found, and l is a, uh, is a completely valid lower bound. And so this is totally non-heuristic stopping criterion. Um, now, I, I don't know that this really matters much, but uh, I mean, just because the ellipsoid method is not really used that much, and I'm not even sure this is that much of an issue. But um, when you're, since you're doing down dates, so 
A down date is when you is when you subtract. You take a positive definite matrix and you subtract. Uh, in fact, this is a rank one. This is called a rank one down date. Now, when you do it, uh, and it's I guess that's supposed to be clever because if you if you get a new measurement in something like least squares or something like that, you would do a rank one update and there'd be a, a plus here. So this is a down date. Um, down dates, uh, I mean, they're fine. Uh, you don't, in theory, this, this, this new matrix will be positive definite. Uh, that follows immediately. Um, but because of numerical round off and things like that, what will happen is this will become um, uh, indefinite. Now, there really wouldn't be any problem with that if, unless your code actually has the square root here. Um, if it has a square root there and you take the square root of a negative number, you, you're going to, depends on what you're using uh, in, in, in a real system. Uh, some exception would be thrown in, uh, in a not real uh, software, uh, then you'd get some complex numbers and, and you'll never recover after that. So, uh, of course, that's, all, that's silly. All you have to do is write G, G transpose PG is less than epsilon squared. That's really all you have to do there. And that's actually pretty cool because it'll also stop when the ellipsoid gets numerically flat in one dimension. So that, that's what that is. However, there's better ways to... Um, if you do care about, if you actually care about this, you can actually propagate a Cholesky factor of this. Um, and when there's, there, there are order n squared uh, Cholesky uh, down date algorithms and things like that that work very well. So, okay. Um, okay, so here's, an exa here's the same example. And you can see your, your lower bound and your upper bound slowly uh, converging. Uh, one thing you can say here is that your, your um, you actually converge much faster than you think you have, or know you have, I should say. Right? So the lower bound just takes a long time to catch up uh, with, with, uh, with the upper bound. OK. Now we'll give the proof of convergence. Um, this is going to look completely trivial. It fits on one page, two pages, I guess. Um, but you have to remember that this, uh, when this was applied to like linear programming uh, in like 19, I guess 79 or something like that, uh, which was the first time anyone proved um, sort of a weak, uh, weak polynomial time uh, solvability of linear programming. This was a really big deal. So, but that's always the fact that I, things after the fact look simple, uh, especially when they're expressed clearly, which doesn't always happen. But anyway, all right. So here are the assumptions. We're going to assume f is Lipschitz. So you have a, a, a capital G. And G, by the way, is, is also, I mean, an equivalent statement to say that G is an upper bound on the norm of the subgradients. And we'll start with a ball of radius capital R. Um, and now what we're going to do is exactly like subgradient method. The proof is going to go like this. We're going to say that suppose that through the kth step, you have failed to find an epsilon suboptimal point. So epsilon is some positive tolerance. And you have failed to find an epsilon suboptimal point through the kth step. That means that f of xi is bigger than f star plus epsilon um, for all those steps. Now, here's, this, is, this is the subtlety. Um, it's actually quite simple, and it's this. This says, uh, let's think about what happens when you throw points out. When you throw points out in the subgradient method, it's because an oracle told you, let's draw, let's, let me draw a picture here. It's because you have a point here, uh -oh. so you have a point here, an oracle gave you a subgradient, and what happened was you threw out all these points. Okay? Now, there's another step in the ellipsoid algorithm. That's when you, there's the good step, that's when you throw points out, and then there's the bad step, which is when you, you actually cover what you know. You actually intentionally increase your ignorance by covering it with an ellipsoid. Okay? So, when you, but when you do this, here's, this, is, this is the subtlety. Uh, every point you have thrown out here has a function value which is greater than or equal to the value there. That's the definition of a subgradient. Well, that's an implication of the subgradient inequality. Now, if this point here is not epsilon suboptimal, so if that's not epsilon suboptimal, then every point here is not epsilon suboptimal because the function value here is bigger than f star plus epsilon, and therefore the function value of every point discarded is bigger than f star plus epsilon. Okay? That means, I'm just going to draw, here's the epsilon suboptimal set. There it is. That means that in every step of the ellipsoid algorithm, up to and including k, 
you have not thrown out any point in that epsilon suboptimal set. Because everything you threw out was worse than one of the function points you evaluated, and all of those were, uh, were not epsilon suboptimal. So they're over here. Okay? So that's the argument here. You, you have, you have if, if you're an epsilon suboptimal point, you are still in the kth ellipsoid. So the kth ellipsoid surrounds uh, this, if that's the epsilon suboptimal set, whatever the kth ellipsoid looks like, it covers this. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's that. Okay. Now, uh, from the Lipschitz condition, if you are within a distance epsilon over g to, uh, let's say, an optimal point, it, actually any optimal point, then you're epsilon suboptimal. So what that says is that there's a ball inside this epsilon suboptimal point, this epsilon suboptimal set here. There's a little ball whose radius is epsilon over g. Let's see if I did that right. Yeah. Okay. So there's a ball. Okay. So now that says that says the following. That says well, obviously, if this thing is inside that, its volume is less. So the volume of that little tiny ball is less or equal to the volume of VK. But these things we know. So the volume of, the, of this ball here is alpha n. This is the volume of a unit ball in Rn. It's actually not going to matter because it's going to cancel, but you know, it's got like uh, gamma functions or factorials and stuff in it, some pi's and things. It doesn't really matter anyway. But it scales like epsilon over g to the n. That's less than or equal to this thing. Now, we've already discussed that. The ellipsoid method reduces the volume of, at each iteration, the volume of the ellipsoid goes down by the factor at least e to the minus 1 over 2n. Or, uh, or is it exactly? Uh, no, sorry, it's a, it's, it's a, it, so it goes down at least by 1 over 2n. So if you do k steps, it's less than this thing. Okay? But this thing is alpha n times capital R to the n. Now you cancel the alphas. Uh, you cancel the alphas, take some logs, and you get this. So there it is, one page. That's it. It basically says the following. It says that if you have not produced an epsilon suboptimal point, then the maximum number of steps you could possibly have gone is this number, period. Another way you turn it around and you say this. If you go more than this number of steps, for example, this step plus one, then you must have produced an epsilon suboptimal point. Therefore, f best k or whatever it's called, that f best thing, that if you keep track of the best one, is less than epsilon. That's it. It's, uh, it's simple. I mean, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's like subgradient. I think it's even easier than subgradient because there's almost no, I don't know, there's, there's, like there's just nothing there. It's embarrassing. Okay. So anyway, it's 1975. You would apply this to linear programming and did all the calculations involving the number of bits and all that stuff. Um, well, you'd be very famous or something like that. Isn't that weird? Okay. So the picture, which anyway I've drawn poorly already anyway, is this. Is you have your suboptimal set. That's, say, say an optimal point. You have the little ball here, and okay, that's it. All right. So we've already, we've already concluded this. Um, okay. So actually we can interpret that complexity bound, um, and let's see how that works. Um, so... Uh, well, you start this way. You start with E0. That's this initial ball. Um, and of course, you have prior knowledge is the uh, Lipschitz constant. So if someone, before you've done anything, you haven't even called the oracle. You simply have a ball of radius R. And someone says, what's your, you know, please tell me what's your best guess of what the point is. Well, you would just take the center. And someone would say, how far off are you? And the answer is, you're off by at most GR. Because the, the optimal, whatever, whatever it is, is at most r distance away. The Lipschitz constant is g, so in the absolute worst case, you can't be more off than gr. So that says that the, if, if someone asks you what's f star, you say, look, it's between this because it's, it, it's got to be less than that. Sorry, less than that. And, it's, and that's the smallest the optimal point could be. So essentially, your gap is gr. Uh, you know, not a great gap or whatever. Well, it depends on the problem, of course. Um, now... After you run k iterations, uh, your gap has been reduced to uh, this thing here, and we know that that's less than epsilon. 
uh, where epsilon and k are related by the two n squared uh, log uh, gr over epsilon. Okay. So, what that means is this: uh, it says that the iterations required to take it from uh, your prior uncertainty in f star to your posterior one is um, is exactly this. That's R G. That's your prior uncertainty, and epsilon. That's your posterior uncertainty. And it turns out it means that you need uh, here. Uh, this is the number of iterations required. Is two n squared times the log of the of R G over epsilon. If you convert this to a log base two here and do the arithmetic correctly, which I may or may not have done, but let's suppose I did, uh, then this would tell you that the number, the amount of information you get per oracle per subgradient call is 0.72 over n squared bits per gradient evaluation. Okay? Um, so, in other words, uh, now of course you'd like the n not to be there, you know, obviously. Um, and in fact, with the CG algorithm, it's not there, right? Uh, so it's not. You just get some fixed number of bits, and I, you'd have to work out what it is. It's like 1 over log 2.6, I don't know, whatever it is. It's, uh, you'd have to work out what that 0.63 thing is and all that. Um, but the point is you get a fixed number of bits in the CG method. Lipsoid method is, uh, is very simple and implementable. It degrades with uh, n squared, with the, with the space dimension. Um, but the wild part is... Uh, you know, that's a polynomial in, the, in, the, in all the problem dimensions and stuff like that. So it's really, uh, it's actually, well, if you're a complexity theorist, you'd be jumping for joy at a result like this. Um, and indeed, they, they do. So that's it. Um, now, unfortunately, it does work. Uh, the ellipsoid method does, is indeed quite slow. Um, so that, and that was actually, uh, I think there was a lot of, um, since obviously a lot of people in the West were also trying to establish uh, the complexity of, of uh, linear programming, and the Russians did not only did that, not only did the Russians do, it, but they kind of did it in, seven, in the 70s, and then somebody else just noticed that it, in the early 70s that it solved some allegedly open problem in the in the West. Um, you can imagine it wasn't super well received here, um, and so then people quickly pointed out that they said, "Well, it's totally useless. It's you know just what you, just what you expect from the Russians, right?" And they said. You know, uh, the simplex method works excellently, but has exponential worst case complexity. But the ellipsoid method, you know, uh, has this uh, nice bound, but works terribly in practice or whatever. And they obviously totally missed the uh, missed the whole point of all of it and so on. So anyway, anyway, they then they then they embraced it. And it was on the front page of the New York Times. Um, so okay. Um, so but the cool actually the very cool part about it is. Uh, I, I really do think you can argue uh, that these methods are actually generalizations of bisection to Rn. And that's a pretty weird thing to say because bisection, when you normally think of it, it's very special. It has to do with R and ordering and stuff like that. And you know, if you're in this interval, you check in the middle and then you're, you're, you're at each step, your, uh, your localization region goes down by a factor of two. I mean, so it's very difficult to imagine how on earth anything like that could work in multiple dimensions. And you can get very confused thinking about it. The claim is the ellipsoid method is it. Okay? And so the good news is something like bisection or in bisection in spirit. Um, yeah, I mean, it is quite like bisection spirit. You get a constant number of bits of, of improvement in information per subgradient call, period. It's not one bit. And it degrades with dimension, but it's absolutely constant, and that's that's kind of cool. Uh, uh, so I, I would claim that that's what the, that's what this is. And notice that we're off even on our our bound here. If you plug in n equals one, we know this says you get 0.72 uh, bits. We know in fact you get one. Um, now that's because the that e to the minus k over whatever uh, one over two n is actually a, a bound um, on something. So the actual number is known. It's not well. Sorry, for n equals one, it's known. It's one bit for gradient evaluation. Okay. Um, well now we can talk about deep cut ellipsoid method. And deep cut ellipsoid method works uh, like this. Uh, let me see if there's a picture maybe here. Nope, no picture. All right, so I'll draw one. Here's the picture. Um, deep cut ellipsoid method works like this. Um, so here's, uh, here's your ellipsoid. Here's your current point. And you evaluate 
uh, a uh, actually now you call a cutting plane oracle at that point. Now a, a neutral cut would come back and tell you something like, you know, you can forget about everything up here. A deep cut comes back sort of with a bonus of information and basically says something like this. It, it makes a cut down here, right? And says, you can actually forget about everything here. Okay? Now, by the way, if you're super lucky and the, this cut comes outside the ellipsoid, uh, well, you can say it's not feasible or it's impossible in this case or you, you uh, I don't know, you go to your reliability system and downdate the and, and, uh, and inc decrement the reliability on that oracle. Um, uh, so, but this is a deep cut thing and now the idea is this, when you have a deep cut like this, you need to, you, you do the same thing, you put an ellipsoid around, uh, I don't even dare do it, okay. Well, God only knows what I've done. Anyway, you put an ellipsoid around the a, a, uh, I guess you would call this uh, a less than half an ellipsoid. There, so that's what it is. It's a, it's a less than half an ellipsoid. And sure enough, there are formulas for that. Um, and those formulas work out this way. Actually, they're quite interesting. They're, they're, very, they're fairly simple. Uh, you take alpha is h over this thing. This is the, this is the length of the uh, normalized, this, this is the, the, length, the length of uh, sort of h, the offset. In, the, in, this, uh, in this new metric. And if that's more than one, the intersection is empty. So that's less than one. And what this says is you actually go in the exact same direction. You step in the exact same direction as the other ellips as the normal ellipsoid. But you take a longer step length and you actually uh, are more aggressive in your down date. Well, that makes sense. You're getting more bits of information. So this is, uh, this is, this is the deep cut ellipsoid method. Um, by the way, other people have worked out formulas for things like parallel cuts. So that's a weird thing where you, what comes back to you is a slab, a parallel slab, and, and, and you'd work out actually analytical formulas for the intersection of a slab with an ellipsoid. Um, by the way, these are not attractive formulas, as I'm sure you might imagine. So, okay. So they have a lot, uh, variations on that. Now, the fact is these are a little bit, um, they're disappointing uh, because you think that's cool if I'm cutting off more than, more than what I need or whatever. And you can always do a deep cut if you have a subgradient evaluation using FK best or whatever, right? Because if you, if you already have a, a value of the optimal, you get, you get a subgradient. If you're, uh, unless you are right now at the optimal, uh, the point that was the best one. But you saw, of course, it's not by any means a descent method. So very often, your current point is worse than the best one you found so far. Therefore, an ordinary subgradient call is going to give you a deep cut there, period. So you might imagine that by cutting more volume out at each step, you do better. Um, and the answer is, well, I guess so. Certainly the volume is lower, um, but it turns out you don't really do that. I mean, it doesn't really enhance convergence that much. I mean, it's, it's something, this is not atypical, uh, something like that, it's quite typical. I mean, you can find examples where it, it does better, but that's, it often doesn't. Okay, so how do you do inequality constrained problems? This won't be a, this won't be a surprise to anybody. I think once you get the hang of all these, uh, cutting plane methods, um, it's quite simple. You do this. If xk is feasible, then you update the ellipsoid met this way, and that's a, uh, this is a deep cut here. So that's fine. Yeah, you do a deep cut uh, thing. Um, if, uh, if it's infeasible, what you do is you choose any violated constraint here, and you do a deep cut here. And a deep cut is with respect to zero, because basically what it says when you do this deep cut is any point that satisfies this is guaranteed to have fj bigger than zero, and therefore to be infeasible. Therefore, when you, anything that satisfies this inequality, uh, sorry, it's the other way around, um, anything that violates that inequality is absolutely guaranteed to be infeasible. In fact, quite specifically, it's guaranteed to violate the jth inequality. That's what, that's what, that's what this one was. Okay, so that's the, uh, so it's the same story. Well, once you get used to these, I mean, it gets kind of boring. So, okay. Um, okay, now if, if xk is feasible, you have a lower bound. If xk is infeasible, um, then you can, you can look, you get this lower bound on f. Now, if this thing here is, is, is uh, positive, then that says the whole algorithm can grind to a halt and you actually have a certificate of infeasibility. So it just 
can't can't work. It's, it's uh, you, you can stop. So that's the stopping criterion. Um, I'll also mention this, but I think again, once you kind of get the idea, it's not a it's not a big deal. Um, and it turns out in this case, the epigraph uh, epigraph trick doesn't really help very much. And we will. Uh, and that, that finishes up our, our discussion of the ellipsoid method. And this finishes up, in fact, the first uh, chunk of the course, so, which is direct methods for doing handling non-differentiable uh, convex optimization problems directly using subgradients and things like that. And I guess the summary is you have subgradient methods, which are like amazingly stupid, one line, uh, one line algorithm, uh, one line of algorithm, uh, and a proof that's about a paragraph. Then you have the ellipsoid method, um, which is uh, you know three, four line algorithm. Um, and the proof is uh, two paragraphs, maybe, something like that. So, um, but the ellipsoid method actually has, I mean, depending on exactly how you define what it means to be in uh, a polynomial time algorithm, it actually has polynomial time complexity. Uh, so I, I, I mention that because that when you get into real problems involving real variables, there's actually different, there's different definitions of, epsilon, of uh, complexity for the problem. We don't have to worry about it. I mean, the traditional one uses rational inputs and has a number L, which is the total number of bits required to describe the data and all that kind of stuff. Um, people have moved towards a, a more realistic one where the, you want to, it's a polynomial to, to get epsilon suboptimal suboptimality, the number of steps required is, or the number of operations required, whichever you're counting, is a polynomial of um, the various dimensions uh, and the log of 1 over epsilon, something like that. So that's the, uh, oh, and a magic number that you're not supposed to ask about. Um, and if you do ask about it, it does depend on the data, and it depends on how feasible the problem is. But you're not supposed to ask. It's not considered polite to ask about that constant. So, okay. Well, this, does this finish up this whole section? Um, I do want to put it all in perspective and remind people that if these are extremely bad methods for solving problems, if there's any way you can pull off like an interior point method, then these are just like a joke in comparison. Okay, so, so these are not for any, th any, any method where you can even possibly think about using an interior point method do not use anything like a subgradient method. It makes absolutely no sense. So we will see, actually, the next section of the course is going to be exactly a method where the barrier, barrier methods cannot be used. Um, and we'll, we'll see why. And the reason is it really has to do with sort of compartmentalization. And so you should really think of all this as useful when you have literally just a black box oracle that evaluates subgradients or cutting planes. And for various reasons, you know, legal, confidentiality, whatever. You can't even look inside. So that's, that's your best, that's, that's the best way to think about it. Um, if you can look inside, you can probably code up everything in terms of a, of a uh, uh, use a barrier method. And you'll have something that is like so much faster, it's to completely insane. So, so you have to think about this, that there's some, there's some requirement that there's an interface, which is a subgradient oracle, and you're not allowed to look on the other side. Okay. Um, so left it here. Okay. So now we're going to start the next topic of the class. Um, it's a uh, the an organized. Uh, so uh, and this topic is on is on decomposition methods and. Honestly, this is the one that's really going to, for the first time, show you real examples of problems where you would use a subgradient method. So, um, and there, as I said, there have to be compelling reasons to use it. And these are going to be very compelling. So, let's just uh, jump right in. Um, uh, the, I should say these methods are like widely used now. They're, um, I mean, it's a sort of a big deal in networking and in communications. It's, it's the, a lot of the basis for all the, most of the intelligent thinking about cross-layer uh, about cross-layer uh, op optimization in, in networks, um, and it has a lot to do with distributed design, distributed decom you know, distributed methods and things like that. So we'll 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 look at these now. Oh, I should say it's also there's lots of other places where it's actually used. So, okay. So we'll start with something really stupid. Here it is. Um, I would like you to minimize uh, f1 of x1 
plus F2 of X2 subject to X1 and Z1 and X2 and Z2. Okay? That's the, that's the problem. And I, how do you solve that? Well, uh, the way you solve it, I mean, you can solve this this way. Um, because the, the first group of variables has, is not in any way connected to the second group. You can choose them independently. And obviously, a sum is minimized by, if they're completely independent, by minimizing each one separately. So here, you do this separately. Now, I, I do want to point something out. Um, now, by the way, it means you could do it on two processors, if you had two processors, for example. So that's, uh, that's one possible advantage. And you'd replace the sum of the runtimes by the max. Right? That's one. So you could trivially parallelize it. OK. Um, now, the other thing is, let, let me ask you this, though. Uh, and let's just, let's just make this super duper practical. Oh, no, let me, let me just uh, uh, ask. Let's suppose you don't recognize that your problem is separable. Let's say, let's make this super uh, specific. Let's suppose that you, you take your problem and you type a CVX specification in, which is separable. What will happen? And I claim you know, you can figure out the answer. No, what should happen is you get a note saying, uh, heads up, your problem is separable. You're, oh, and it could say, semicolon, the next line says, I'm solving uh, two, two problems separately. Right? And if you had multi-cores, uh, you'd, you'd be told, uh, you'd look and some process would, uh, would get forked and start up on some other processor. Okay? That, maybe something like that should happen. It doesn't. So, you tell me, what happens? In fact, let's make it really simple. Let's forget the constraints completely. No constraints, unconstrained. And let's make F1 and F2 smooth. So you're going to use Newton's method. What happens if you accidentally fail to recognize that your function is a sum of two independent functions and you use Newton's method? What happens? The problem is like N1 plus N2 or gross. Okay, so everything that's squared is there you go. Okay. Uh, is squared or what? What's our cube, maybe? Cubed. Okay, very good. So here's what happens. If you're doing Newton's method, you're gonna you're gonna your dominant effort, let's forget the calculate actually forming the Hessian and gradient. The dominant effort is gonna be something like uh, n1 plus n2 quantity cubed. But if you recognize it as separable, it's n1 cubed plus n2 cubed. Everybody got that? And let me tell you, that second one is a lot better, uh, depending on, well, no, it depends actually on the numbers, right? If they're very skewed in size, it's, it's not that much better. Um, but if they're equal, it's like, what, 4x or something. I mean, actually, honestly, 4x is not a number worth going after. Um, but, you know, fine, don't make it separable into two. Make it separable into 10 different things. Okay. So, okay, so, so big payoff if you're doing Newton's method and you recognize a problem is, is separable. Okay, but let's think very carefully about it. Can you tell me about the Hessian of a function that is a sum? What is it? Diagonal. It's block diagonal. That's exactly it. It's block diagonal. Now, that's interesting. So let's say that your code is written well enough that it handles, uh, let's say, sparse matrices. Let's imagine it were. If it weren't, we already know you're going to pay for it because you're going to get the n1 plus n2 cubed versus n1 cubed plus n2 cubed. So we know you're going to pay big time if you don't, if, if you don't exploit it. Um, if, if, you're, if your linear algebra is, I guess, what I call intelligent linear algebra as opposed to stupid linear algebra, um, then uh, that's no reflection on you, of course. So, sorry. Uh, so um, what happens? If you're using intelligent linear algebra and you see something like an h backslash g, let's say, and h is block diagonal with an n1 and an n2 block, how long does it take to solve that? n1 cubed plus n2 You got it. Okay, so, so basically any sparse solver would recognize that, right? Any, any, sparse, any method for sparse matrices will take a, to, will take a, a, a matrix which, in a, you know, if it's solving ax equals b, will take a matrix a that's block diagonal, right? and basically do an ordering that solves one block and then another. Now, it's going to do it serially on one processor, I mean, typically. But, you know, so you don't get the parallelism speed up, but still. 
Um, so everybody's, so the conclusion of this story is the following. Uh, well, it's a little bit subtle. It basically says that if sparsity is recognized and exploited, you will, the speed up will come for free. And now we come back to the question that started all this. You have CVX, so you're running CVX, and you throw at it a problem that is separable. Now you tell me what happens. You can guess. What do you think is going to happen? It's smart enough to know that it's sparse. Absolutely. So it's going to, well, I mean, I often, I mean, this is your, this is subject to the whims of the gods that control uh, heuristic sparse matrix orderings. But unless you wrote some really, unless you wrote some code that made every effort to try to confuse and make a very complicated thing. So, but if you wrote out a basic one, uh, CVX will very happily compile your problem into a, uh, a big, uh, you know, let's say second order cone program. Okay? It will be separable. Of course, you could check that instantly in a pre-solve, but let's forget it. Suppose you don't. It will very happily solve it, and it will it will say, okay, let's see, what do I have to do at each step of which I intend to take twenty or thirty or whatever the number of interior point steps is? You say, well, I have to solve this here uh, for this here, uh, you know, primal dual uh, search direction. It sets up a big system of equations, and then you make a small offering to the god of sparse matrix ordering, uh, heuristic orderings, and if you did that, uh, and she smiles on you and your problem then you'll get an ordering that will basically give you the full parallelism speed up. Okay? That, that's what happens. So, the conclusion, that was a very long way to say the following. Um, it probably, except for problems with not recognizing uh, orderings or something like that, it will probably give you the speed up. Okay. So, anyway, this is a long story. All right. So, this is, and obviously, if this was max of F1 and F2, it would be the same thing. You know, that's totally obvious, right? Because... That's fine. Okay. All right. So, so far, nothing I've said has been anything It's totally obvious. It's along those lines where you can't imagine the things we're saying are so trivial that you can't imagine uh, we're headed towards anything of consequence. Actually, most things are like that, to tell you the truth. They sneak up on you. Okay. Um, well, now suppose two problems are all... Now we're going to talk about what happens... What the idea of having um, a problem that's almost... Uh, separable. So almost separable would be a problem like this. I want to minimize f1 of x1 y plus f2 of x2 y. So that's my problem. And here I, I partition the variables into three groups. You know, the, the, uh, if you want, you can think of these as the private variables associated with system 1, the private variables associated with system 2, and then the joint variables. And by the way, just there's no reason not to start talking about it now because it's to get you uh, to get the flavor of where all this is going, what the applications are, you might think of this as two portions of a firm, two, two subunits. That's unit one and unit two. These, these are choices unit one makes in its operations. And they are, uh, they're private. I mean, no one, they're not even going to, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, that's its business. Um, X2 are the choices that unit subunit two makes. Why are the ones that, that sort of involve both? Uh, so, for example, things where they absolutely have to coordinate. Okay. Now, what you call here is Y has got lots of names, but it's called the. Uh, oh, by the way, this a lot of this material goes back to literally 1960 at Stanford. So this is things like George Danzig and things like that. Dan so decomposition is a very old idea. Um, uh, okay. So Y is called the complicating variable here because it. Uh, well, obviously, if it were if it were absent then this problem would be separable, and it would split. Um, so let's see. Uh, so here you can think, you should think of these as the private or local variables, and you should think of Y as a public or an interface or a boundary variable. So these are, these are the names and ideas you should be using uh, to, to, uh, to, to think about uh, how this works. Okay. Um, so here's primal decomposition. I'll give the... Uh, the method goes like this. Um, we, what we're going to do is the following. We're going to have uh, two sub-problems. Um, and what we're going to do is this. Uh, you fix, imagine Y is fixed. 
Okay? So uh, y is fixed, and we're going to minimize over the uh, x1 variables, f1 of x1 and y, and we're going to minimize over x2, f2 of x2 and y. Okay? The optimal value of this one we're going to call phi1, and the optimal value of this one we're going to call phi2. So these are, um, these are called, and notice one thing. Uh, these problems can be solved uh, privately. They can just, they, they do not have to coordinate. They, they don't even have to tell each other sort of what the optimal value of x was or anything like that. Uh, they could use different methods. They can be physically separated. They can run on different processors and all that kind of stuff. They just do this. Um, and we think of this thing as a function of y. Now that's, that's partial minimization. And you'll remember that if you have a convex optimization problem, and you minimize over some of the variables and, and write the optimal value as a function, consider the optimal value of the, of the problem as a function of the remaining variables, that function is convex. Okay? So that, that's the partial minimization rule or whatever it is. So these are convex. And in fact, if you were to minimize phi 1 plus phi 2 over y, this would solve the original problem. Uh, by the way, don't, if, if, I hope this isn't confusing. The only way it could possibly confuse you is because a big deal is being made out of something that is utterly trivial. So what is, what is being said here is that if you need to optimize something over three variables, x1, y, and x2, you can do it in any order you want. In other words, you can, you can minimize over x1 first and consider the result a function of the remaining two, then optimize over the second, then the third. In this case, we can optimize over x1 and x2 separately and first, and then finally optimize over y. So this, this, is, this is completely trivial. Now, this is called primal decomposition, um, uh, obviously, because we've sort of pulled, the, the, uh, we've pulled apart uh, the, the primal. And so, by the way, if you want to get a rough idea of how this might work, it would be something like, like this. You have two, let's make y, uh, you know, just a handful of variables. And by the way, your conceptual, the way you should, conceptualize this is this. You should think of x1 as being some big variable, some x2 is a big variable, and y, hopefully, because these methods will be most effective there, uh, y is small. So, for example, you might have, uh, I don't know, let's say two people designing a, uh, a circuit. So that, that's, that's what it is. Um, there, and what happens is you want to minimize the power of it. Um, and the way you would do that uh, each, each, section, each, each of the two subcomponents of the circuit has a power. That's F1 and F2. X1 and X2 are giant vectors that give the, for example, the device lengths and widths or something like that. Or the choi you know, basically, the circuit design choices in, in the, the different parts. So, there, so X1 and X2 are giant thousand-long vectors that tell you how to design that circuit. Um, but they have to coordinate um, on, for example, a handful of, of, of variables. For example, um, if the whole computation has to be done in 100 microseconds, uh, the first block, uh, the, you might have something like, you know, the, they, they will agree that the first block will complete its computations in 30 microseconds, and then the second block will then take no more than 70. See what I'm saying? So that, that's, it's how you divide up the requirements of the timing, for example, would be why. Okay, so now the way this might work is, is the following. Is that's some private method, some circuit synthesis method. That's another one. And what, would ha what happens here is you, in this case, because it's just one complicating variable, which is y, which is the number of microseconds. And it might go from, let's say, 15 to 85 or something. It's the number of microseconds in which number one has to do it. If you make y too small, uh, this guy is in a super rush because it's been told that that sub-circuit has to be unbelievably fast. So it redesigns it as best as possible, but it consumes a lot of power. This guy, however, is very relaxed. It says, oh, 85 microseconds, no problem. All the devices are minimum width and blah, blah, blah. And it's, you know, very, it consumes almost no power, but the sum is bad. Anyway, so you could, this is sort of the idea. So then you'd, you'd solve this problem, which is basically you optimize over that one variable, which is how you divvy up uh, the timing. So that's, well, we'll look at lots of examples, but I just want to sort of give you a rough idea of how this, where we're, what, what this is for. Okay. Now, if the original problem is convex, then so is the master problem. Um, and you, there's lots of ways you can solve the master problem. Um, if there's a single complicating variable, um, then you could use bisection, obviously. So that's how you solve a con that's how that's one way to solve a convex problem in one variable. Um, you could use a gradient or Newton method if these phi i's are differentiable. By the way, the phi i's typically are not differentiable. 
in, in many cases. Of course, if the Fs are, it is, but in many interesting cases, they're not. And of course, you could use subgradient, cunning plane, or ellipsoid method. Um, now, each iteration of the master problem requires solving the two subproblems, and, uh, and if you're lucky, uh, this can actually be faster than solving the original problem. Now, uh, there is a, a tension here, and I should say a little bit uh, about that. Um, decomposition, if you look in the literature, you know, if you go to Google and type, you know, I don't know, optimization, decomposition, you'll get stuff all the way from the 60s. And I should tell you that, that, that some things have changed a lot. So in the 60s, you know, I mean, these are, remember, this is a time when, you know, solving a 100 by 100 set of linear equations was a big deal, and 1,000 was like, you know, large scale and all that. It's a joke for us now, right? Um, this is actually before sparsity methods were well developed and stuff like that. So, I mean, totally, you know, this is like iron core. I mean, you know, really visualize uh, the time, uh, to be fair to, to people then. So their decomposition in the 60s was mostly used just to solve problems that actually, for us, would be laughingly small. I mean, they would be direct, direct methods uh, kind of things. But it's for problems. It, it, then it was used just because they just didn't have that much memory. Their resources were there. And it was the only way to solve a problem, you know, what, what they would call an enormous problem with up to like a thousand variables, right? Which, of course, is a joke now. But, you know, that's what Moore's Law propagated for 30 or 40 years does. It gets a very, very big number, uh, a big factor. So uh, we can't make fun of them. However, I believe this is, so I should say the following. If you are able to collect F1 and F2, in one place and solve it using an interior point method, you are almost certainly better off doing that. The sparse matrix methods, we just discussed it, they will actually exploit some of the same structure that you would, and they'll do a way, way better job. So, so if, you have the cho if you have the option uh, of collecting the prob all the problem data into one place and solving it, there's absolutely no doubt that's the right way to do it. No, absolutely none. Um, so the, if you want to kind of visualize an application nowadays where you might want to do this, it would be basically that these are two companies two, or two different design teams or whatever, and they actually have no intention of sharing the details of their design with the other one. They're two subcontractors. They're making two, um, I guess what they call, you know, IP blocks or whatever in a circuit or something like that, right? So, and they have absolutely no intention. What they are willing to do is the following, is if someone the, basically, the master says, design that block to clock in 15 microseconds or whatever, you know, to, to, to complete its calculation. Then they will come up with a design. They actually may not even reveal x1 until you pay. But you don't need to. All you need to do is, is have an oracle for this. They're going to have to give a subgradient. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay? So, so you should think of these methods as one involving in, in, uh, encapsulation. Uh, layering in communications, uh, boundaries between things where the opaqueness, the, 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 where the, you have well-defined interfaces and the interfaces are there not because it's 1967 and we're trying to solve a, you know, what would be called a big problem then. It's not for efficiency. It's basically for other, it's for organizational reasons. So the same, it's like layering in, uh, in communications or something like that. Okay. So we've looked at this, um, and here's primal decomposition algorithm. I mean, it's really pretty dumb, but it's, it's actually, it's, it, you, have to, it, it, you have to understand this first, and then we'll, we'll get through. So here's the way it works. Um, I have two subproblems, and it works like this. Uh, the master publishes a, a, a variable y, and it says, this is, what y, this is y, this is it. I want both of you to deal with it separately. So the, both of the subunits deal with it. They, they say, okay, no problem. They take these specs or whatever, you, or commands, orders, what do you, whatever you want to say. And you, each one minimizes uh, their function. And they do it using, sep they can be separate. It can be, uh, they can be separate, use totally different methods, uh, different processors, you know, blah, 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 this sort of thing. And the only thing they're required to do, so the contract here or if you want to talk about the layer, the interlayer communication between the master and the, and the subproblems is this. The master sends y, and the subproblem must, does not have to even reveal x, the optimal x. 
the subproblem must send back the following. It says what F1 is, and it sends a subgradient. Actually, the truth is, in the simplest algorithms, it doesn't even have to say what F1 is. So, in the simplest method, it doesn't even have to say what power it achieved. I mean, it, that's a courtesy. But technically, it doesn't even have to. So you have two units, and y is a common variable in a company. Somebody says, here's y. It's the vector, you know, this, this, this. These are the entries. And, and you're, they're not allowed to question it. They optimize their thing. Each generates a, you know, a minimum cost. And they don't even have to reveal what the minimum cost is. They do, the protocol requires them to return a subgradient of the optimal cost. Okay, so that's, that's required. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, and let's see how this works. Um, oh, and then this is just a subgradient uh, method. You can use any other, what, any other method would be fine for non-differentiable optimization. Okay, so it's an example. Uh, you have uh, two piecewise linear functions in R20. They're both of size 20, and each is the max of 100 affine functions. And the actual optimal problem uh, optimal value of the whole problem is 1.71, okay? And y is a single variable here. So there's a single, so basically you have uh, two, um, two sets of 20 long vectors. Those are sort of the private one, the, the, the ones associated with, with unit one or unit two. And you have a single variable y, a scalar, that, that couples, that they have to cooperate on. So, okay. Um, and so here, we vary y. And what you see here is the cost of, you know, this is the cost of subunit one. By the way, um, what is, what kind of function is phi one and phi two? It's the minimum of a piecewise linear function as a function of a variable appearing affinely in the objective and constraint. It's also piecewise linear. <coughs> However, it looks curved here. And it, the reason it looks curved, there's two possibilities. One is I'm wrong, which would be unfortunate. But then that's be fine. People could go back and look at it and, I don't know, could go viral among all my professor friends and they could say, watch, look, go watch this. Watch, watch Boyd say something incredibly stupid. Uh, anyway, that's, a, that's option one. I don't think that's true. Um, option two is the following. Uh, is, is, I believe, what, what, what is the case. Um, when you have a piecewise linear function with a hundred max of 100 affine functions in R20, um, it's, piece, you know, it's a piecewise linear function. How many like little regions do you think there are? I heard the answer, and it was correct. Lots. But what, should, what has to be emphasized is it's not just lots. I mean, it's lots, and that's in, big cap, that's in a big font. Um, vast. It's you, a huge number. Okay. The point that it's piecewise linear, you know, really doesn't really help us. So I believe this is piecewise linear. Is it guaranteed that the total, total function value will go down at each step? Is it no. Okay. Uh, no, because it's a subgradient method. So, um, by the way, if phi 1 and phi 2 are differentiable, uh, they're not here. But if they were differentiable, you could, um, here's what you could do. Uh, if, they're, if they're differentiable, uh, you, you could use a gradient method, in which case, or a Newton method, the Newton method, you have to renegotiate with your subcontractors here to return uh, a, a, a second derivative. Um, that might be tough. But you can certainly use a gradient method, and then for sure it would be guaranteed to go down. So, but not here. Okay, so the sum is this, and then the optimal value of y is somewhere around here, or something like that. So that, that's the picture. Um, okay, so this is primal decomposition with bisection on y. Um, and uh, indeed here... The, the overall, you know, you actually do worse after one step and so on, and then you go down and so on. And then it's a bisection method, so this should be going down uh, like that. That's the, so that, that's primal decomposition using bisection on Y. I mean, it's a stupid example. It's, uh, it's not the point here. Um, it would be the point if, for example, these were, if the two, if the two things here, right, were gigantic uh, units that, uh, that hated each other, uh, but for some reason had to coordinate on a cooperate on some single variable, um, and they hate each other so much that they would they wouldn't even think of revealing the dimension 
of x, let alone its value or anything like that, or any of the details, then this protocol uh, will work. And it's actually pretty cool because if, I mean, that's how you should be conceptualizing all of this. You should think about it is this is actually a protocol that allows uh, two almost separate problems to come to mutual global optimality by a very limited number of communication rules, right? Because that's really what's happening here. It's not much. The interface is very well defined. It is very small. What is revealed is very small. Everybody see what I'm saying? I mean, that's the right way I believe to think of these methods. Oh, sorry, in the modern context, right? Because uh, the, the currently, this, these, are, these methods are not really used. There's a, I know some examples like multi-commodity flow, but generally speaking, these methods are not used the way they were used in the 60s, which was just to solve a bigger problem. And they just couldn't fit everything in the memory, which is pathetically small. And so they would kind of you know, pull one in, kind of solve it, pull the other one in, and then adjust some things and so on. Um, OK. So um, and uh, let's see, I think at this point I want to ask a, a question, because we're going we're gonna to go, uh, I want to go back to uh, Newton's method. So let's go back to Newton's method. Um, so let's see what happens. Let's suppose we're doing, uh, let's, let's see what happens in Newton's method when you have a complicating variable. Okay? So let's, let's, let's actually try. And I'm going to write the Hessian out. So I want to minimize this. I don't know who can see this, but I want to minimize this using Newton's method. Right? Now, we've already discussed what happens when y has dimension 0. When I form the Hessian of this, it's block diagonal. And I mean, if, if you're not paying attention, you pay n1 plus n2 cubed. If you're paying attention, you play n1 cubed plus n2 cubed. But now, what does the Hessian of that thing look like? That's what I want to know. And I'm going to write it in a very specific way. I want x1, x2, and I want y. And here's my Hessian. And I'm going to, th these are just late, you know, this is just a mnemonic that's kind of way out of whack here. Um, okay. And you should think of x, try to think of x1 and x2 as huge and y as small. Okay? So let's see, I, I'm going to just do it this way. Let's write out partial derivatives. Um, so for sure you're going to get, you're going to get a lot of, lots of x1, x1 interaction. So, I mean, let's imagine, right? This, and, and you're going to get x2, x2 interaction. All right. Um, are you going to get x1, y cross terms? Absolutely, right here. So, and I've drawn this totally wrong, and it looks bad, so I'm going to re... Okay, so I, I'm going to draw it small, okay? There's, there's, these are the, those are the x1, y interactions. How about x2, y? Yep. Okay. Uh, how about y, y? Yes. You never get rid of that. Okay. And then, of course, it's symmetric, so you get this and this. Okay. And now... Uh, comes the moment of truth when uh, I get to ask you, does that look like anything you've seen before? Please say yes. Thank you. Thank you. I was actually getting a little bit depressed. With the, you know, because we went over 364A so fast. I know I covered this in like one lecture and blah, blah, blah. But thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. And um, I don't want to press my luck here, but... Um, uh, May I ask, so, uh, and how would you solve this? Just, to, just roughly, I had no details. I, I'm, block elimination, okay. Ah, oh, feeling much better. Okay, and uh, what block would you, do you tell me the block that you see that's easy to invert? Block. What's it? Block diagonal plus. There you go. <laughs> so the block that you would elim that you would invert, so block elimination, Gives you an advantage. When there's a block, you can invert easy. What does invert easy mean? Well, okay, it means invert easy really means invert easier than treating the whole block as a big dense blob. Okay, and in fact, look at that. This is block diagonal, and of course, we know if this is like n1, n2, easy is because n1 cubed plus n2 cubed is less than n1 plus n2 quantity cubed. There you go. Funny because that's exactly the separable issue. So. So the, the effort to solve this, I don't, you don't have to give me the, the whole number, but if that was a one there, suppose it was just one complicating variable, what would be the effort to solve that problem? I just want the order in N1 and N2. What would be the, the order? Well, block elimination 
you would you'd form something like a sure complement. This thing times the inverse of that times that. That's a sure complement. And what size would that be if this was size one here? One. So the sure complement is is what we generally call a scalar. Uh, sco solving scalar equations is pretty easy. That's a call to div or whatever it is. Um, so basically that costs nothing and the only thing you have to do is actually solve this thing times the inverse of that times that. That's a Cholesky on this guy and a back and forward, Cholesky on this guy back and forward, and the total complexity is like n1 cubed plus n2 cubed. Okay, that's very cool. Because what it means is, so let me just summarize what we've just said. It comes back exactly to, to our discussion earlier about the F1 and F2. This is very, very cool. It says, if there are complicating variables in a function, like in a, in, in a function you want to minimize, it's, it's almost separable except for some irritating little variables or something like that. It says, the, and you're going to apply Newton's method. Then, and, and remember this because this is sort of the theme of, of how all this works. That says, if you don't know what you're doing, which is another way to say this, if you're using stupid linear algebra, if you're not aware, if you're not, if you don't know, if you don't recognize and exploit structure in your linear algebra, you're going to pay like crazy. You're going to, you're going to say, nope, not separable. So suppose all you put in there is a separability detector. That's, it's going to say, nope, everything's coupled. Sorry, you have to choose everything all at once. Everything's coupled. You, there's nothing you can do separately. Can't do it on two processors. Oh, by the way, you can do that on two processors. So I didn't talk about it at the time, but block elimination will run on multiprocessors. And I mean, in many cases, that's the whole point. So that's, uh, that's nothing, but I didn't talk about it. But that's, so here, if you don't exploit linear algebra, you're going to pay for it. You're going to play n1 plus n2 plus 1 quantity cubed. If, however, your linear algebra is intelligent, meaning it exploits sparsity, if it does it automatically, you'll just get it immediately. You won't even know why Newton is, being, is so fast on a problem like this. Everybody see what I'm saying here? So I, I promise you, if these things are, if these are like, if you write a MATLAB script and it's sparse and all that and everything, this thing will be way fast. And you'll say, wow, that's fast. You won't even, I mean, you may not know why. I mean, of course, ideally, you should know why. You definitely should know why, because if you ever wanted to do something that was real, uh, which is to say, if you wanted to implement it in a real language, uh, you would need to know why. And, and not just say, it's because something is happening in CBX or something like that. Okay, so. So I, th these, are, these are paralleling things here. So uh, complicating variables in the general non-convex, in the general, sorry, non-differentiable case, you get an advantage. Um, you can get an advantage. And, but the same thing comes up in a, very, in a somewhat different way in Newton's method. So actually, that's kind of a parallel theme, that, that uh, there are both ways to exploit structure. One at the linear algebra level, one at the MATLAB. Uh, sorry, at, my god, where did that come from? God, that's, that's the kind of thing I'd like to edit out of a lecture. Um, I'd leave that other one in that even if it was wrong, just because, you know, I can amuse some of my friends or something. But that one I'd like to edit out for sure. Anyway, um, sorry, you can exploit structure at the linear algebra level or up at a much higher level uh, using something uh, like this uh, there at, at a very high level. Uh, so, okay. So, okay, let's look at dual decomposition. And, and then this is... Uh, this is, an, uh, this is another, it's very cool, uh, goes like this. I want to minimize this, uh, the same problem before, you know, f of x1y plus f of x2y. And what I do is, it, you know, it's like everything in duality. You get these weird things where everyone understands basic duality. You describe the Lagrangian. And then you do like incredibly simple, stupid transformations of the problem. Like if you have f of ax plus b, you write it as f of y. And then below that, you push on the set of constraints, you append. The constraint y equals ax plus b, and you think like, well, no good can come of that. But then all of a sudden, you turn on the uh, Lagrangian, uh, the, uh, you know, grind, all, all the gears grind, uh, uh, grind forward, and something happens. So the same thing comes here. Um, you would hardly, say, if someone came up to you and said, okay, the first step in, in this problem is going to be to make two private copies uh, for the different subsystems, and then add a constraint that they're equal. Um, this doesn't look promising. I mean, I have to just say that right out. Everyone agree? This is not exactly, it's like congratulations, you just uh, added more variables and more constraints. And the constraints are not exactly what we'd call complicated. Okay. But actually, the, the, um, what's beautiful about this is you think of y1 as the local version of what y is supposed to be. And y2 is the other local 
version. So, of course, we have the constraints that they're equal. So this, this anyway, I have to say, this doesn't look promising uh, as, a, as a beginning. But now watch what we're going to do. We're going to form the Lagrange dual of that transformed problem. And when we do that, you're going to get f of x1y plus f of x2y, plus then, of course, just the Lagrange multiplier, new, uh, multiplied by y1 minus y2. Again, uh, it doesn't look uh, interesting until you look at this, you stare at this for a while, and then you realize, my god, this L is separable. Uh, you can minimize over x1 and y1. It's a sum. Um, you associate this thing with that, and this thing with that, and it, it's, it's, it's completely separable. So for example, if you're asked to find the dual function, it can be done separately, the, the two subsystems. So the advantage of having uh, two local copies of what is supposed to be a common variable is this, is they don't have to ask anybody how to minimize their, uh, th this thing. So, they just, so you just minimize it, and you get, you get these things. These are related, of course, to the, um, to the, the conjugate uh, functions. Um, but then you, then you end up with, you get two completely independent uh, du dual uh, uh, Lagrangian minimization problems. And these give you two components of the overall dual function, g1 and g2. And uh, by the way, computing these, basically minimizing this thing and minimizing that thing, these are called the dual subproblems. They can be done in parallel and completely separately. Um, and if you want a subgradient of g, you need a subgradient of g1 and a subgradient of g2. And it turns out these are nothing more than y2 minus y1, uh, because we did that a little bit earlier. Um, and that's amazing, because this has a beautiful interpretation. That's the inconsistency. That's the inconsistency in your local copies. Or another way to say is, I don't know, discrepancy. It's the discrepancy between your two local copies of it. And that's the subgradient of, of, uh, of this thing. And nu is going to be a price vector. OK? And so here's dual decomposition. We're going to go over this next time, don't worry. So, but here's dual decomposition. Um, what you're going to do is the master will distribute you can think when, the, when in primal decomposition, the master produces y. And it's basically fixing variables. It's saying, you get this amount of warehouse space, you get this. You must, you must complete your calculation in 15 microseconds, you get 85. That's primal. Dual is this. You don't mention the numbers. Instead, you give a price. And you say, the price on warehouse space is you know, $13 per square foot. And the price on microseconds of delay is this. And then you send them off. And what they solve, what the subproblems now solve, is they, they minimize this. That's their cost. But they have to decide why one here. And the way they do that is through a, this is like, this could be a fictitious or a real charge. That's what it could be. It could be completely fictitious. Or it could actually be money transfer. That's, that's the cost. That's when the master, the, the uh, parent company, actually says to them, you run your business however, however you want, optimally, of course, minimizing cost, maximizing profit, whichever you want. You, you, you subunits, you op, you that. However, you use warehouse space, then we're going to charge you this. And that may not even be on the open market. That might be for internal accounting in the firm. Everybody see what I'm saying here? And then they, they simply say, well, how much? Then they'll use as much uh, warehouse space as they can until the use of where the, the, the charge for warehouse space like eats into their profit or whatever, something like that. But anyway, you, you, you get the idea. OK. So, so basically, now the problem with that is if you set a charge for warehouse space, like for you and for you, and then you use some amount and you use some, there's no reason to believe that the sum is actually the total amount of warehouse space we have. So we haven't, and it basically means that it hasn't, uh, so what I have to do is I have to adjust the price. And in fact, that's what this is. So you simply. Uh, so methods like this, by the way, in economics, they're, com they're very fundamental and they're called, um, well, it's, this, is, this is called uh, a price update method or, or uh, Taton Ma is another, uh, another name for it. Um, and in fact, they would talk about this. They would call this like an externality or something like that. Because basically it says, oh yeah, you can do whatever you want with Y1. But when you use Y1, which by the way is supposed to also equal this thing, um, it has an effect on others. You don't care about the effect on others. It'll only be reflected through this kind of market price here. And then this is a price update method here. So, okay. 
Um, oh, and by the way here, the, the, the iterates are generally infeasible. Um, and in fact, if the iterates are ever feasible, you terminate instantly. You're done, absolutely done. So if, 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 if you solve yours and you, and, and, you like, uh, and you solve yours and you're too wise, or if you achieve consistency, you're absolutely finished. Um, because then it's optimal. Another way to see that is this, of course. Um, that's the subgradient of G. A super gradient, I don't know, whatever, however people call it, whatever the right name is. That's a super gradient of G. If you actually achieve consistency, the super gradient is zero. And if the super gradient is zero for a non-differentiable concave function, it's optimal. You're optimal. And that's it. So, okay. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll quit uh, here and then uh, continue uh, this next time. And we are, by the way, yes, we are working on a homework for, for you. So just as we know you, don't have, you have nothing to do right now. So we'll, we'll fix that. We'll quit here. <laughs>